Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Serenity OS update for August 2022. It's been a nice and relaxing month in the project. We've seen around 950 commits across our repositories, and uh, a lot of people are on vacation uh, and enjoying the summer. So uh, we'll see if things start to speed up again uh, next month. But um, we still have a whole bunch of things to show you today. Uh, a lot of interesting things in those 950 commits. Uh, and I got some friends here to help me out. So first, we are going to hear from JT, who's going to talk about the Yacht programming language. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It's me, JT. I am giving the Yacht update this month. Um, there are some cool features that landed this month that are definitely worth talking through. I've kind of queued them up. We'll go through them one by one. In this first one, what we have is you can now use the is keyword to get the type and shape of the thing on the left-hand side. Here we know it's one of the variants from the enum. So we can say e is a x. And we had, I think this feature, even last month, I think we had this feature available. But this month, you can now use that x a little bit later. So you can match out the X, now you have it. And then you can use the X in the rest of the expression. Very cool for some compound, uh, look into this, grab this out, look into this, grab this out, and so on. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot of in trying to design Yacht is not to write word drift. I think I probably mentioned that in one of the updates. Um, we definitely talk about it in the developer videos if you ever watch any of those but um, yeah this is one of those examples where you because you can just kind of compound these together and have uh, you know get this match and then use it and then do something else you can just do it all in one line you don't have any multi like needs to embed yet more uh, if conditions or matches inside of this block. So that's a that's a nice kind of time saver. The next one is kind of taking that idea one step further. And we were throwing around this idea of what happens if you do the same thing, but in a guard. Uh, recall the guard's job is to say after this point, this value, you know, this condition is going to hold or has held, you know, so we know that after that, that that condition was true. If it's not, then it's going to return, right? So we immediately get out of the control flow if it doesn't hold. This allows us to do the same trick that we did before with taking out a binding of X, uh, using it in conditions. So we show that here. We can bind foo, get the bar X, and then use X in the condition. But a cool thing with guard in this position and this kind of style that we are working in is that because we know that X exists at this point, we know that foo is the bar of X and now X is available, we can use that later. So this is another one of those to prevent rightward drifting because now we can say, okay, as long as the, the condition holds and we have this new variable visible and it has this particular condition on it. Okay, cool. Now we don't have to make a match in order to have that. We can just know it because of the guard and then completely on the left side, you can see we haven't indented at all at this point. And we already know that X exists and it's less than 10. So very cool to have this as a, as a kind of nice shorthand. Um, we, we implemented those first two uh, incidentally. So this work is by folks like um, Adler and Rob and uh, Ali and myself and Andreas, like a whole bunch of people have been working on this. I, I would remember who did what, but <laughs> I don't remember who did what. So I just want to give a quick shout out to everybody. Um, but one of the things that happened after this is we landed um, those first two ideas uh, as real syntax and uh, Andreas and some other folks went in to the compiler and started updating the compiler to use the new syntax. So it got a bunch of good testing right at the beginning and a lot of good usage out of it. 
Okay, so that is um, kind of the compound with the is in a match for if and guard, and also seeing how guard can continue using that binding later. In a slightly different realm, we have um, this example where we have a con oh no I want this one first let's go this one first um, so here's here's our next one which is to talk about array slicing so up to this point we didn't have a good way of saying you know yeah you know, here's my array I want to slice from this index to this index give me a slice of that index and I want to use that uh, you can kind of think of these as views into the array between you know certain ranges or I should say in a certain range, uh, range of indices. And uh, yeah, here's one example of using it. So we've got, you know, our one, two, three, four, and then we slice from the first to second uh, elements and then look into that. All right, now let's look at the one I was looking at a second ago. So this is, uh, this is something that Ollie's been working on uh, this month, which is the compile time functions. So this ability to do um, some computation in a function at compile time rather than runtime. So when the compiler runs, it's going to take this function, turn it into something that it will sit there and crank on in the background. And once it gets the answer, that's what it's going to put into the output C++ for the final build. So here it will run Fibonacci 16, give you the answer to Fibonacci 16, put that value in first, so you don't actually do this computation at runtime. Uh, this is incidentally pretty powerful, as we'll see here shortly, um, but just in this form is already pretty cool. Oh, actually, let's just go ahead and do it. What the heck? Um, I am going to show you this cool little thing. So we have Fibonacci. We have compile time functions. Well, what if you, let's say, uh, wrap, and then we're going to call REPL. Yep, that's right. We have a REPL now. And this is all built into Yacht itself using the same kind of logic that comp time is using. So we're just writing some syntax that is being converted into these, um, into these interpreted values that can then be shown to us as, you know, kind of interpreted and then shown the value to us. We can do more than just, you know, three plus four. We can actually create, say, um, a foo that takes in an I64 and then returns maybe x of plus 100 or something. And then we say if x is 4, there you go. So there's a lot of um, the language that's covered by the interpreter. Uh, the interpreter has more that we want to do with it. So there's like, it doesn't cover the whole language yet, uh, but it does cover quite a bit. It covers matches and functions and, and um, a lot of things like that we will probably ultimately extend this to be part of the test suite itself so that we can cover basically the whole language at compile time. And that also means the interpreter will be able to run pretty much the whole language, uh, minus, of course, things like, you know, uh, unsafe C++, you know, probably not going to interpret C++. But uh, for kind of all the safe yachts, you should be um, you should be able to run it at compile time. So we have REPL, and then there's also this other one that uh, you can also say dash dash run, give it a file, and it'll treat that file kind of like a script file. It'll run that and interpret it just like it would on the REPL. So that's a cool uh, cool set of new features that we're just starting to scratch the surface of what's possible with them. Okay, that is compile time execution. And then finally, something that I'll show off this week is the uh, work that I've been doing with Andreas on inheritance and inherited hierarchies and polymorphism, uh, class-based polymorphism. 
So in this example, you can see we create a parent, we create some virtual function, we've got a child that inherits from a parent and then overrides that virtual function. And with that, uh, we can create a child and then pass it into a function that uses a parent and then call into this, and then we'll get the, uh, the overridden um, method as a result. So a lot of kind of moving parts and components to get a start on object-oriented programming. And there's still more that we need to do. Um, one of the big reasons we put some time into the object-oriented programming stuff this month is because without it, we really can't do the GUI apps in Serenity just yet. So we do need to kind of go in there and, uh, and make some changes, uh, make some improvements to what we have here. This is a good start. We want to be able to inherit fields. And there's a, like a couple other places that need to be updated in the type checker to get real flexibility out of this. But we're getting pretty close. Um, probably another session or two or if other folks want to join in by all means and uh, help push us over the line. Because once we can do real kind of real Serenity applications in the language, I feel like that's where we really start, you know, giving it its real test um, when we're actually kind of quote unquote shipping the applications we write with it. Go. Cool. Well, thank you, JT. So here we are on the August edition of the Serenity OS desktop, and we got a whole bunch of things to look at today. So I guess we'll start with something kind of fun, and that would be this new effects tab here in the display settings. So uh, this was added by Thank You Very Cool, uh, and it allows you to selectively enable and disable various system effects like animations, uh, but also uh, other visual things like these tab accents, for example, I can turn those off. And then you see you get um, more uh, classic uh, Windows 2000-like tabs, but I personally quite like the accents, so I'm going to leave them on. Um, but yeah, so you can you can um, mix and match what kind of little embellishments you want on the desktop. So uh, pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Very cool. Very cool. And uh, speaking of TYVC, um, they also did a whole bunch of other stuff. So here's an example. We now have these collapsible toolbars. Um, when the icons of a toolbar don't quite fit on screen, then we now get this little overflow menu here, which allows you to see um, everything that couldn't fit in the toolbar. So the remaining actions, basically. And this is used in a bunch of apps. So you can see it here in the bookmarks menu that browser has. Um, and it also shows up in various places. And it, it's easy to reuse as well. Um, so that's pretty awesome. And uh, since I'm talking about Thank You Very Cool, uh, I also added a little context menu to the workspace picker down here so you can get to the settings quicker. And Thank You Very Cool then went and made the picker itself look much nicer. So um, all very nice little tweaks and polish improvements. Super cool. Um, so let's look at something else. Um, new in text editor this month is some work on the Vim mode. So if we switch into Vim emulation mode, um, now Robbie went and did a nice big patch to implement uh, visual line mode. So if you... Um, press shift V, then we go into this visual line mode, which is a standard feature in other VIs as well, uh, which allows you to select multiple lines, and then you can delete them or do various operations on them. So very, very cool. Thank you, Robbie, for working on that. Okay, so let's also look at pixel paint, which I did a bunch of work on this month. Um, and some of the stuff I worked on was selections related. So uh, a bunch of things related to selections. For example, selection changes are now part of the undo stack. So I can undo, redo selection changes. Uh, and um, we now have a wand select tool. So you can do this magical wand select. Uh, this was implemented by Timothy. So thank you, Timothy, for doing that. Um, we also added 
undo redo support for a lot more actions. Previously, it was not really pervasive. Now, almost everything can be undone, uh, which is obviously something that you want. Um, the undo menu also now shows the name of the thing that you would be undoing. So undo brush tool, undo rectangle select tool, undo wand select tool, and so on. Um, and I think that turned out really nice. And one thing that <laughs> bothered me in particular was layer creation. So it used to be that you would create a new layer and it was not an undoable action, but now it is. So uh, thank you, Roberto, for doing that. Uh, and then I did, well, first Roberto did that one, and then I did most of the other things, making making everything else undoable as well. Um, oh, and another feature I did was crop image to content, which does this. So it just um, makes the image sort of snugly fit around your non-empty content pixels. And uh, then uh, another Andreas, not me, did some bug fixing in that as well. Um, and uh, I was working a whole bunch on pixel paint. I did many videos about it because it was a lot of fun. Uh, I also did like layer rotations. So uh, that's actually not the best way to, to see that because you can't see it rotate while I'm doing it. We should, um, maybe we should have a different way to access these. But yeah, so you can rotate layers, flip them and so on. And of course, these actions are also undoable. So very, very cool. Uh, I think Kleines Filmrochen also did a new filter this month, um, the median filter. So let's try it out. Kluk. Yeah, there it is, median filter. <laughs> Perhaps not the best test image for that, but regardless, thank you, Kleines, for working on working on the app. Oh, by the way. Uh, Brandon also added some new um, menu icons. So I saw the, I think the add mask icon is new and um, flatten image. Where is flatten image? Right here, this one is new. Uh, and a bunch of other icons are new as well, although I don't recall exactly which ones. Uh, but thank you, Brandon, and to everybody really who, who um, works on app, desktop polish, stuff like this. It's makes a huge difference and is, is really, really appreciated because you elevate the app so much by, by adding better icons and improving the icons and so on. Anyways, that's, uh, that's Pixel Paint. And, oh, by the way, um, in File Manager, I didn't mention before, so there is a, uh, a new context menu item for um, setting a wallpaper. So. Uh, here, you can set as desktop wallpaper. Uh, that's kind of cool, although I'm going to put my dung beetle wallpaper back here. But the context menu for setting the wallpaper was added by Cflip. So thank you, Cflip, for doing that. Uh, and a little thing that I did was um, traversing this breadcrumb bar here with keys. So um, Alt up always brings you to the parent directory but alt down now moves in the reverse direction on the breadcrumb bar. So you can use that to sort of navigate to, um, to, the, to the child, if that makes sense. I just, it felt like something that we should do. All right. Um, oh, something else that's been going off the chain this month is uh, emoji support. So we have many, many new emojis this month. Um, and if we open this up here, you will see, I think this is now a generated list of our emojis, uh, and it's just a lot of them. Um, and I spoke to Jaja, who said that we have, I think, over 400 new emojis this month. A bunch of people have been working on them. Jaja, Beckett, Ryan, uh, Brandon, and Kleines, um, possibly somebody else that I'm forgetting, but just absolute mayhem, uh, people drawing emojis. And it's it's awesome. I love these little pixelated emojis that we have, although um, they are pretty small. And you it's like you almost need to have the magnifier if you want to really appreciate, appreciate them. So let's take a look here. See, look at these little fellas. <laughs> 
Um, oh, and I think we also have a web page on emoji.serenityos.net uh, where you can sort of track our progress adding emojis. Um, and this is, I think Recha made this website as well. And it, as far as I understand, it seems like we have 36.64% coverage. So still plenty of emojis to draw, but uh, already we have a whole bunch of them. And I don't know if I am killing the browser by loading this. No, it seems like to, seems like can handle it. Um, very, very cool. So thank you to everybody who's been working on the emojis. It's, um, it's an unexpected area of, <laughs> of, uh, serious activity this month. And it's just really fun to see. Um, by the way, if you're not familiar, uh, you can press, um, control alt space and you get this emoji picker if you want to insert an emoji somewhere. So I want to put the fire emoji, although I have to say this emoji picker is, <laughs> I think it doesn't actually fit on screen anymore. We have too many emojis. When I added it originally, we had like 20 or something, but uh, we have clearly um, grown past the point where this um, primitive sizing strategy here, I think it's just hard coded to 10 columns or something like that. We, we probably need to do something smarter and give you a search bar or something. Lots of opportunities to improve. Anyway. So that's been going on with emojis. Um, and then we have a new settings app. So Sam added this games settings um, dialog here. And currently it only has settings pertaining to our card games. And the idea was that you should be able to configure a custom uh, deck background picture. So if you want to have a yak themed deck or a lady ball deck, uh, you can now switch to different decks. Uh, you can also edit the background color of the card games. So if you prefer, you know, something a little bit more brownish, then you can you can have that. And then it should then be reflected in all of the card games, as you can see here. And I think in order for this to work, Sam also made a new class called card game and then uh, refactored all of our existing card games to be built on top of the card game class so they can share code for stuff like this. So all in all, nice refactoring and nice little feature set. And it's lovely to see more settings stuff being added because I remember <laughs> when we first added the settings uh, window and it had like one or two entries and it looked a little pathetic. And now it's starting to fill in. So that's that's really lovely. So thank you, Sam, for working on that. Um, and then something that's non-visual but awesome is that uh, Lucas did a bunch of work on multi-user support. And something that has been uh, kind of crappy for a long time is that uh, we have had hard-coded paths to um, the various IPC services in the system. But now, the temp user directory here has a uh, directory per user account. So 100 is my user ID. And if I go in here, portal, then I can find all of my IPC portals. And if you log in as a different user, you'll get a different directory uh, with your UID. And this ha is something we needed to do forever, but nobody actually took the time to, to work on it. And Lucas finally did and, and made this nice abstractions for it, and it's it's just really awesome to see uh, some real progress on multi-user support or multi-account support. So now you can actually log in as multiple users and they don't have to step on each other's stuff. Um, so thank you, Lucas, for working on that. Um, and, uh, oh, something else I always like to see is we also have a new key map this month, I think. Uh, somebody added a check key map. It was uh, Zorbi, I think. Yeah, so we now have check key maps, both programmers key map, quirts, and a standard one. I don't know if that's a QWERTY or quirts or what, but uh, there are now options for, for check keyboard users. So thank you, Zorbi, for adding those. Um, and then I also wanted to talk a bit about uh, the kernel. So um, one thing that we've been, that I've been talking about in these videos, 
um, every now and then is multi-core stability or SMP stability. And it's something that continues uh, to be worked on by myself. I, I did a lot of work this month uh, on fixing deadlocks, uh, fixing race conditions, and, and just refactoring a lot of the kernel uh, memory management system to be uh, able to work uh, with fewer locks and um, take locks in the right order, stuff like that. And I'm happy to report that it's been very, very successful. In fact, ta-da, this whole presentation has been on SMP with uh, two CPUs. So um, we are definitely a lot more stable than we have been before. And I don't know if I would say that it's ready to be the default, but it's certainly ready for testing uh, so that we can help each other iron out more of the bugs and, and track down the remaining deadlocks and stuff. So this is really awesome. Uh, and I also want to thank the people who contributed to uh, SMP stability at this month. Uh, in addition to myself, I saw Edan, Tim, Brian, um, possibly um, somebody else working on that. But thank you so much to everybody who's been helping out with this. And uh, if you're interested, uh, run with SMP enabled. And if you find deadlocks, then let us know. Uh, or help track them down if, if you're interested. I think this is going to be really, really good. Um, so yeah, that's that's multi-core. Um, also in the kernel, we've seen more progress on the ARCH64 or ARM64 port. Timon has been working on that. Uh, Philip started helping out with that as well. Um, we've also seen some progress on the USB infrastructure. So Black Cat is working on some of the um, USB transfer stuff making progress there. So lots of good stuff happening. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's um, everything I wanted to show you here on the desktop today. So now we're going to let Linus talk about the browser and JavaScript stack. All right, let's have a look at all the browser changes from the last month. Um, so that's been a little bit of activity. Uh, a bit more in libjs, I would say, but there's still a few things to look at. Uh, so first of all, we have MacDew, who has worked a lot on gradients. So um, you can now have gradients in all colors and directions as you wish. So we have linear gradients, and then you can say to top, so it goes from bottom to top, and then you specify two colors, and it fades between them, or you do it the other way around, or left to right. And you can also mix colors. Um, I don't think there's a limit to it. So you could make very colorful gradients or you make gradients with a hard transition. So instead of fading between two colors, you just specify percentages um, and then the colors have a hard edge. Um, works with multiple colors as well. Or you do like zigzag uh, like this or you do them uh, in a vertical way, like here. So there's basically uh, no limitations to what you can do with these. It's just really cool to see. Um, so great work on the implementation there from MacDew. And then we have Sam who did some work on Canvas this month. And Sam implemented Path2D, which is an API. Let's have a look at these source here. So Path2D is an API where you basically um, encode your drawing instructions separately from the canvas. So instead of telling the canvas, now draw a line here, you just make a new path. And then on that path, you draw a rectangle or you draw or you move somewhere else and draw an arc. And then you give the canvas uh, that path and the canvas will then with its color and thickness settings, draw that path. And it also works with SVG, which is really cool. So down here, you can see uh, we're passing a SVG string to the path to the constructor and then, then draws um, should be filled with a back square. Or maybe it actually doesn't work yet. So maybe that's work in progress. Uh, but great work by Sam on Canvas 2D. And he also did a lot of refactoring there uh, to bring it a bit closer to the spec, which is always nice. And then next up, we have a basic implementation of CSS Grid now. So after Flexbox has been ongoing for a little while, 
uh, Martin made a start on CSS Grid. Uh, it's still early days, but as you can see, um, this basic example already works. So we here we have a should render a two by two grid, and we have one, two, three, four, and indeed that is a two by two grid. Let's also have a look at the source. You can see just a bunch of diffs, and then they apply the grid item class, uh, which makes it light blue as a background, and the outer container is display grid, and with some inline styles we say template columns auto auto, and that uh, then creates the grid. Or here we have a hard-coded height, uh, which you can also see as one and two are definitely taller than three and four. Uh, so thank you very much, Martin, for this. Um, definitely needs more work going forward, but it's a, it's a great start. And then lastly, we have the CSS clip property implemented, uh, which was done by Tom. And as you see, it just allows you to cut off some stuff that you uh, don't want to render, for example. So here we have a regular uh, box with some text in it and uh, it just renders like a border around it, but half of it is gone. And the way that works is you just specify a clip rect uh, where it then cuts off when rendering on the page. Um, and then lastly, we have a change to the browser itself instead of the underlying engine. Uh, Sam implemented it so that you can specify uh, two or more URLs when invoking the browser. So previously you could only say browser and it would open the default page or you pass a single URL and then it would open that. But now you can, as in this case, for example, specify four different URLs or four equal URLs as I did, and they will all open in different tabs. Um, so this might be useful. All right, let's have a look at all the libjs uh, JavaScript engine changes from August. Uh, as usual, first of all, the uh, test 262 score is currently at uh, just hitting 82% for the AST interpreter and a slight increase on the bytecode interpreter from 69% uh, to 71.7. Uh, uh, um, so still going upwards there, which is good. And then in terms of changes, there's been a whole lot of changes under the hood this time. So we will not be spending as much time in the REPL for demos, um, but instead have a look at some code. So first of all, Andreas implemented a optimization uh, known as rope strings, where when you combine two strings, um, so for example, foo plus bar, um, then it creates a string in memory foo and a string in memory bar, and uh, then a third string foo bar. But uh, to save some time and allocations, we can not create that foo bar string, so as a copy of those combined, until we actually need it, for example, for printing it out or for iterating over its code points, stuff like that. And while it's um, in its internal representation, we simply point to the old foo string and the old bar string as a left and right hand side. So this uh, is what you can see here. Uh, we have a new function to create a rope string from two other strings. Uh, so primitive string is just like a string literal, for example. And then it does some basic special casing for empty strings. So if one side is empty, we just give you back the old string. We don't need to create a new string. Um, but if there's a string on both sides, uh, then we make a new rope string, which has just a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And then once we need to resolve that, there's a bunch of uh, special handling here for UTF-16 conversion, if that's needed, and then like joining both strings together. And uh, it makes it a lot faster if you, for example, um, append to a string in a loop. Um, so imagine you have like an empty string and then in the loop you add uh, more st string fragments to it. Uh, so this is really nice. Um, then we have David who has implemented something called nanboxing uh, this month, um, which is used to decrease the size needed by a value, uh, which we use at runtime for basically uh, every JS value uh, as a more generic type that then wraps things like a Boolean, null, undefined objects, and so on. And so 
Previously, we had a little enum here, which would tell you the specific type. Um, and so an enum is 32 uh, bits added to every instance of this class at runtime, which adds up to a lot of memory. Uh, so what you can do is encode everything as a double, uh, which might seem unintuitive, but there is some space in this double left over, which is used for nonce, so not a number. Uh, which have like a little uh, payload space, which is uh, unused otherwise. So we can use that to um, encode everything from like a pointer to an object on the heap, or a Boolean value, or a regular double, so a number value. And then in that space that we have left over, which here is called tag 60 bits, we simply encode as a bit pattern the type and that saves us uh, a lot of memory overall. Um, so very nice, very nicely done. A um, lot of commentary here. So if you're interested in this, uh, definitely have a look through. Um, but yeah, really like this. And it's also a optimization found in other engines like SpiderMonkey or WebKit's um, JavaScript core. And then as you can see here, uh, when we need to find out what specific type it is, we just um, switch on the tag and then compare it against some um, um, just numbers internally, Boolean tag, symbol tag, and so on. Uh, yeah, great work by David. He also did a bunch of correctness fixes uh, in everything from number passing, with statements, tagged template literals. Uh, did a lot of work on big ends. So conversion from double to big end is now um, much more um, smart and doesn't just truncate to a 64-bit integer, um, which really helps. Uh, so yeah, great to have you uh, back working on LibJS, David. And then I did a very big refactor around global objects and realms. So all over the engine, we would basically pass in a global object to every operation that could throw an exception. Um, because the global object is where we stored the prototypes. And the prototype is basically what determines object identity on a realm. So if you make a type error in one realm that has a different distinct prototype than a type error from a different realm. And if you compare them, you can still see that both are type errors, but they have different prototypes. So they are not really the same type error, so they wouldn't compare um, equally against each other, for example. And now we just pass, so everything got converted from taking a global object to a RAM, uh, which is now where the intrinsics, for example, prototypes are stored, uh, which means you don't need a global object anymore for constructing any other object. So it can be done in a different order, uh, which in turn unblocked Andreas on a thing he did where in libweb, um, every object uh, will lose its wrapper. So every object internally will become heap allocated. Um, this is still work in progress, so I will show you next month probably. Um, but it's been a long adventure and I'm really pleased with the result. Uh, it's just led to a bunch of cleaner code and closer to the spec and also fixed uh, various issues with cross-realm um, behavior. So where you um, operate on an object that has originated from another realm, for example, or throwing from another realm and then catching it in the uh, outer realm, things like that. So um, this was a lot of work, but I'm very happy that it's finally done. So I wanted to mention it. Um, we have the usual set of spec updates. So there's been some changes in upstream ECMAScript around uh, regexes, for example, which Tim took care of. And we have the never ending temporal, uh, which Luke and I worked on a little bit. And Tim did some changes to duration format in Intel. And um, that's about it, I think. And then we have a new thing in the bytecode interpreter as of today, uh, which is super called. So in a class that extends um, from another class, you can call super to invoke the constructor of the parent class. And that was implemented by Leon. So um, already worked in the AST mode, but now also in bytecode. 
And lastly, I want to mention two videos from this month uh, related to LibJS that I really enjoyed watching. So David made a sort of tutorial, if you will, um, for contributing to LibJS. So everything from getting a bug fix to testing it to making the final pull request is covered. And um, James recorded something working on a Metamod uh, source plugin, which is really cool. So that's just an external project, but embedding LibJS for scripting, which is something we haven't really seen before. So I really enjoyed watching that as well. Uh, links to those will be in the description if you want to check that out. Um, yeah, that is all and back to Andreas. And that's all the stuff we had to show you here today. So thank you so much for checking in and staying up to date with the project. Big thanks to my co-hosts, JT and Linus. Make sure that you check out their channels here on YouTube as well. Uh, they both do hacking videos and other interesting content. Um, subscribe to them. If you want to come chat with us, do join the Discord server. There's a link to that in the video description. Uh, I also have a weekly live stream here on YouTube on Fridays at 4 p.m. Swedish time uh, when we talk about Serenity OS, Yacht, and, and all of the related projects. So come by and chat. Uh, finally, if you would like to sponsor development of Serenity OS, you can find donation options for some of our developers in the video description below. I myself am working on this full time since May of last year, thanks to the very generous support of many awesome people. Uh, and it's been absolutely amazing to be able to focus on this full time for, for this long and to continue to do it. So thank you all so much. Um, all right, that's it for today. So see you all next time. Bye.